Politicians are often painted as craven, self-interested rogues, which is often unfair, but it's more easily believed when some behave in ways not even becoming of high school student government. Allegations of terrible behavior by some municipal politicians in this province over the past few years has put a spotlight on all municipal councils and their codes of conduct. With elections coming in October, let's check in on this with, in the nation's capital, Joanne Chianello, City Affairs Analyst for CBC Ottawa. In Hamilton, Ontario, David Arbuckle. He's Executive Director of the Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks and Treasurers of Ontario. And in Markham, Ontario, John Mascarin, partner at Aird & Burles, who specializes in municipal law. And it's great to have you three on our airwaves tonight. I just want to start by putting a bit of a list out there for those who haven't followed the story as closely as you have, because uh, we're not talking about just a couple of things here. There's a lot going on. So, Sheldon, let's get this list up here, and we'll go through a bit of the hits and misses. Name-calling on social media, yeah, we're seeing lots of that, of course. Alleged attacks on personal property. For example, allegations of repeated keying of a councillor's car, harassment of municipal staff, refusal to participate in investigations of said harassment, as is the case of an Ottawa councillor, civil suits against election officials, sexual harassment allegations, council meetings cancelled for weeks due to infighting and municipal staff refusing to attend council meetings because of said infighting. Uh, and the list goes on. Joanne, you've, uh, let's start with you because you've been covering Ottawa City Hall for many years. Is it worse today than it was? Yeah, I think it is uh, in some ways. I mean, those are a lot of different subjects, right? So social media has been worse for all politicians and also members of the public everywhere. So that's its own special category of people behaving badly in public. Um, for councillors, though, I think one of the things that we've seen here is... Uh, people have been there a long time. We have some veteran counselors. And, you know, here, uh, our most infamous case, of course, is Councillor Rick Shirelli, who's been a counselor for almost 30 years, has found just uh, uh, two big reports, damning reports, finding a pattern of harassment and sexual harassment in his office for years and years. It, it was a shocking case. And, yeah, I think people have thought uh, the council behavior is worse now. We'll talk about what consequences are possible and have been laid against Councillor Shirelli and others. We'll get that uh, still to come. But, uh, John, why don't you pick up on that? You've been watching this uh, from your perch in the legal community for many, many years. Is it worse now than it's been? You know, Steve, it, it appears worse because, of course, it's magnified now uh, because now you have to have codes of conduct in every municipality. And so you see these coming forward much more. I, I differ from Joanne. I think this has always been the case. I think councillor members have always been behaving badly throughout the years. And it is more recently that a spotlight's been focused primarily through the accountability and transparency mechanisms put in place by the Municipal Act. So I I believe uh, you've seen really atrocious behavior now brought to the spotlight when it didn't used to be before. Well, let's, I guess, remember the Ontario Municipal Board was created about a century ago because there was so much uh, <laughs> malfeasance and corruption on local councils all across Ontario. So, right, there's nothing necessarily new in this, but, uh, okay, David, why don't you come in here and tell us uh, from your vantage point, does it feel worse today than it's been? Yeah, and yeah, I think it's important to remember too, Steve, that there are thousands of municipal councillors throughout uh, throughout Ontario alone, and just uh, a lot of very well-meaning uh, people in it for the right reasons. But the reality is, and, and we're hearing from a number of our members, uh, you know, that are primarily uh, municipal or, or exclusively municipal staff, that the environment is not a good one right now. That that there is there are constant opportunities for, especially public opportunities where there are councillors who feel that they are, you know, the members of the opposition and it is ultimately their job to challenge and uh, to influence staff in their decision making. So, yeah, it's certainly the, the feeling that we're getting from staff is that the relationship between both council and staff is one that's uh, degenerating a bit within the province. Let me share some numbers with you and uh, by extension with our viewers and listeners. This is from an Ontario Municipal Administrators Association poll. And they discovered after surveying members that 77% reported harassment and bullying by elected officials on the non-elected staff. 76% stated being personally harassed by a member of council. 
Uh, okay, David, come back in here. What do you make of those numbers? Yeah, this is certainly, those are certainly numbers, Steve, that are, are being reflected by our members. I've been with AMPTO for just over a year now, and I've had probably about a dozen emails from, from uh, our members that are echoing those numbers uh, as well. And uh, the key piece is we even have some members, uh, I've had probably about six members who have told us they're leaving the sector entirely as it relates to the relationship that they're, uh, or the experiences that they're having at a local level. So certainly, yeah, certainly our members are reflecting those numbers um, uh, on, you know, again, a weekly and monthly basis. John, how do you react to those numbers? Those numbers are uh, egregiously bad, aren't they? Um, and I, I have been hearing those things for many years now. I've been an integrity commissioner for about uh, close to 10 years, I think. Um, and it's something that I have been aware of. And the, the reputational damage to municipalities, uh, you, can't, you can't undo that uh, when, you, when you hear these things. Um, and it is a real concern. Joanne, when you watch Ottawa City Council meetings, and admittedly, a lot of it's been online over the last couple of years as opposed to in person, so that may exer exacerbate some of these difficulties, but do, do you routinely notice elected officials picking on staff members, as this poll suggests? You know, I, uh, there are, it's a really fine line, right? Because, of course, council should be able to uh, question uh, the decisions of staff, the 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 you know, why they're making certain calls. Uh, they should be able to disagree with staff, right? I don't necessarily see them picking on them. Uh, there have been a few incidents, for example, our previous uh, general manager of transit, you know, we've had a big LRT issue here. There have been councillors who've asked him to, it's called him for account, and on occasion the mayor has demanded an apology. And I'm not sure that it, that, that counts as harassment. It, it's a really hard question, right? But for sure, there are lots of other incidents where you have heard, count, you know, counselors say, I'm a counselor, I can do what I want. Um, I can make or break your career here. And of course, that's harassment. And I actually go back to John's point where I think politicians, not all of them, of course, um, have often treated staff poorly, uh, but we haven't seen that. And there haven't been these vehicles for staff to uh, complain about that before. Well, David, just for argument's sake, let me make the flip side of the argument if I can. Politicians, theoretically, are accountable in a way that staff are not, right? Staff don't have to go up to the electorate every four years and get their jobs renewed. Politicians do. Is there an argument to be made that, that as a result of that added accountability, uh, you know, the buck stops with the politicians and the staff should just toughen up if politicians are asking tough questions? Yeah, I, th I think part of the challenge here, Steve, is that there's a, a general misunderstanding sometimes of, of counselors in uh, understanding the role of staff and the traditional role of staff. Staff has an obligation and sometimes uh, even a professional um, um, uh, mandate to bring forward policy advice that is you know, neutral and um, unpartisan and is in the best interest in relation to their, their own profession. So a lot of times there is... Um, you know, uh, counselors that not, don't necessarily understand that, and they're taking it uh, as a you know a personal affront to uh, their responsibilities uh, as a counselor. And the other piece to remember too is a, a number of times, and counselors often forget that is that they're not the ones responsible for directing staff. Staff is accountable to council as a as a whole, and ultimately they're bringing advice uh, to that council uh, as a whole. In order to get some some uh, some direction, so I think I think really the problem lies, again from a staff perspective, is a, really a lack of understanding on the council uh, uh, from a council perspective that uh, it really is um, it really is the staff's responsibility to bring that advice forward, uh, regardless of sort of the political intentions of the individual councillors. All right, Joanne, but help if us. I can jump in, yeah, yeah please I do. wanted to jump in there. I mean, but council are the people, uh, they are the elected officials, and they wear all the decisions of council. So I can understand that they want to know exactly why decisions are being made. They want to know why policies are being made. They're the ones that say yes or no. Uh, we have this great system here, uh, a situation here where a uh, LRT a billion dollar, you know, a, a multi billion dollar uh, decision was made by council. It turns out that there was weirdness about the procurement, right? That one that the proponent hadn't actually uh, uh, met the minimum test score, right? And so 
I don't want to get into the details here, but council's wearing that decision, not the staff, not the people behind the scenes who made that. And so I understand why they want to know what those decisions are, why they disagree with that. Um, and it's it's a hard position that they're in because they're also, uh, as David says, they're not experts in these matters. So they are counting on staff to bring them their best experts and they have to take it on face value. And when they don't agree, it can seem uh, tense. It can seem egregious. But, you know, there's a line. How do you disagree with that uh, in a respectful way as opposed to harass people, call them names? call them out on, on social media. And that's, I think, what's been changing. And I'm not sure, also, John and, and David would know more because I watch Ottawa. Is it different in smaller municipalities? That is always my sense. The bigger ones like Toronto, Ottawa, they have a big system, right? They have like big bureaucracies and integrity commissioners and clerks, and, and they have a lot of people, a lot, a lot of process, right? That is probably missing in some of the smaller municipalities, what, what are there, 333 in Ontario. So they're gonna be a lot different right across the board. It's actually more. It's 444. But, John, right. you, you want to pick up on that, John? Yeah, you know, David made some really good points uh, earlier, and, and they were points that were um, enunciated uh, to some large degree in a judicial inquiry report by former Associate Justice uh, uh, Morocco in the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry, where he talked about the difficulties that municipalities get in sometimes when councillor members do not understand what the role is. They are the captain of the ship. They tell the crew where they're going. The crew gets them there. That's how I always say it when I'm doing orientation sessions for council and I try to describe the roles. But Justice Morocco spent a lot of time talking about staff are there, as David indicated, neutral, impartial, uh, uh, not partisan in any way politically, to try to get council where it wants to go. But council doesn't need to go in and micromanage, doesn't need to go in and tell staff what to do. Joanne's point is in smaller municipalities, you don't have that huge amount of staff. And so therefore, council members almost feel like they can come in and start driving the ferry to the island, which is a matter that I had to investigate a couple of years ago which is completely wrong. You've got the ferry master who drives the ferry, not the council member who takes it over because he doesn't think it's going fast enough. So that's the problem, I think. Uh, council members really do not understand. And in the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry, Justice Morocco did recommend that there would be, there should be changes to the Municipal Act to recognize specifically that the role of council is not to individually instruct uh, uh, staff, the, the role of, the, individual members of council is not to instruct staff. John, just because your metaphors are so fantastic, I want to put a follow-up question to you if I can here. And that is, it does focus on the Ottawa example and Councillor Shirelli, who has gotten himself into a great deal of trouble over the last years. And apparently all council could do was dock his pay for 15 months. Do you think we need a change in procedures in Ontario whereby if somebody behaves egregiously, <laughs> Uh, his or her colleagues can say, you know what, we're impeaching you and we're kicking you out of your seat because you've gone beyond the pale. What's your view on that? Well, that's a really tough one because you see such terrible behavior in some municipalities that you say, hey, that should be the result. The problem with that is, uh, Steve, is that most places, uh, most uh, most assemblies do not allow their own members to kick out a fellow member because that was the, that would be the tyranny of the of the majority, right? They'd be uh, perhaps not liking the maverick views of a particular member of whether it's the council or the assembly and all of a sudden feel that it's appropriate for them to remove them. Now, the province is looking at things like this. There was a huge consultation uh, commenced last year by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to look at what to do with, uh, with members. Alberta passed recall legislation, not only for local members, but also for members of the Legislative Assembly and for school boards. So there are at foot, uh, at play, 
certain uh, initiatives to bring forward greater penalties. But your, your, your point is well taken. There's only two penalties that are authorized under the Municipal Act for a breach of a code of conduct. One is a reprimand, which is a slap on the wrist. Uh, you know, we, we don't think you're doing very well. We're going to denounce that. And the other one is a suspension of pay for up to 90 days. Of course, Rick Shirelli had six separate or five separate five. instances. So five. Uh, thank you, Joanne. There was five separate instances. So not 90 times five is 450 days, which is over a year of uh, free uh, work by this council member, which some members would say, hey, he shouldn't be there at all. I think I agree with them. I want Joanne to pick up on that, if you would. How much appetite was there on council? And we should stress, Councillor Shirelli uh, defends his innocence in all of these matters. But how much uh, appetite was there among his fellow councillors to have him thrown off council altogether, even though that wasn't an option? Uh, after the second report came out, uh, uh, the Integrity Commissioner brought it forward and a council voted on it. They immediately and unanimously passed a motion asking him to resign. Uh, Minister Stephen Clark, he is the Minister of the Municipal Affairs and Housing, personally also asked him to resign, which is unheard of. And of course, he has said no. Uh, he is still on council. He's getting his pay again uh, as of late last year. Uh, but, you know, even while he was being unpaid, he was a council. Counselor, he was collecting his pension. Um, and it is amazing. Every time I talk about this story, we've done a lot of coverage of this here at CBC. Um, I'm on the air. I get letters all the time asking, well, why is he still here? When is he leaving? And it was interesting. The public was just not aware that there's no mechanism for uh, removing someone from office. And uh, it's pretty interesting because there are mechanisms if you, there, you, you know, breach a financial rule. For example, there was the case of uh, Jim Carriganis in Toronto, spent too much money on his um, celebration party after the 20 elec uh, 2018 election. He broke some financing rules and he is literally no longer a counselor, but someone who has broken behavioral rules, codes of conduct to a, you know, quite shocking degree. There's really no way to remove them uh, from their elected seats. And people were shocked by that. There's, you know, a huge move in Ottawa to change the rules. David, help us understand this. Uh, we have seen examples where relationships among councillors and or with staff have gotten so bad that councils just don't meet anymore. How do municipalities make decisions when their elected fish officials don't actually meet? Yeah, that's an excellent, an excellent uh, uh, point, Steve. The reality is, though, is there needs to be a better understanding in relation to that overall, that overall role. And one of the things, just going back to, again, what, what John was talking about with the provincial consultation, I did a bit of research back between 2014 and 18 in relation to where, uh, how councils were actually uh, doing in relation to holding their count, their individual councillors accountable. And the reality is, is actually councils are doing a fairly good job between 2014 and 18 of accepting integrity commissioner recommendations and actually holding those individuals ac accountable. But the reality is, is it, it's not having enough effect on those that are the, the really the most egregious cases. And uh, that's something I know that the province is looking, as John mentioned, very, uh, very concretely. But and, and again, uh, to your question, Steve, the reputational damage that happens in relation and the paralysis that can happen to a municipality when councils are not, um, uh, you know, working effectively or individual councillors are, 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 are um, taking uh, that piece away. It really has a, a dramatic effect on both the council, the reputation, and also really the, the ability for a municipality to actually do their, do their job, which is, you know, building, growing uh, municipalities in their communities. Yeah, John, let me get you to weigh in on that, because I think we all understand that, that uh, cities and towns have a certain momentum uh, that, you know, things will happen even if councils don't meet. But... You know, if you want to build that park or you want to build that LRT or if you want to put in that social housing project, the council has to meet and decide to do it. How do those decisions get made when councils aren't meeting? You've got a great point there, Stephen, because you have in Ontario the open meeting rule, which means that councils have to act 
in an open meeting, in an, uh, a, a meeting that's open to the public. And that's the only way that they can pass bylaws. So you can effectively cripple what's happening with the municipality. There's a, there's a small municipality a little bit up north where a council member has berated all of the senior staff, so much so that the treasurer left, the CAO left. The clerk left. The clerk is a mandatory person that must attend council meetings. And everyone left. The municipality was crippled and for months could not continue its business, which is an incredibly huge problem for municipalities. Unless there's some sort of delegation bylaw, and how would you have put it in place knowing that these things were going to happen? The municipality's um, ability to go forward, as is, as David said, uh, paralyzed. And uh, the real business of municipalities, the hard decisions, the zoning bylaw or the official plan that must be enacted uh, won't uh, go ahead. The budget that must be approved. So it's 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 a real real issue. Now, one of the reasons we know what's going on at Ottawa City Hall is because Joanne Canello is there to keep an eye on it for us, and we can you know rely on her to see what happens and then report on it, and therefore we know. We also know there are media outlets, newspapers all across Ontario that have been shutting down over the past few years, and the the fourth estate's job as a watchdog on municipal malfeasance is therefore much, much tougher to do. Joanne, how much do you think declining media outlets is responsible for an uptick in bad behavior because we're just not seeing it because there's no one there to report on it? Yeah, you know, I, I can't uh, argue on the cause and effect, but uh, it is certainly... Uh true that there are fewer people covering council. You know, when you have eyes on things, people, you know, these are politicians, they want to get elected. And if uh, people know what they're doing, if they know that they're hiding things, they're not having meetings, that they are um, uh, behaving badly, that is a problem, right? And so, you know, when I started covering the Ottawa City Hall in 2010, there were more than double the number of full-time people covering it than are now. You know, right now, I know of uh, myself and my colleague, Kate Porter, our Ottawa, the Ottawa Citizen Reporter. We are the three full-time people covering City Hall for English media here. Uh, there used to be at least six people who were not just, you know, uh, coming in for that meeting, but full-time. And so they understood the rules and they understood uh, what was happening. And, you know, it was terrible. In 2014, I'll give you a quick example. It was during the election. I'm covering the Ottawa election, but there was a town east of here who said, can you please find out why the mayor is suing our city, or the, its own, the own, our own city? And I said, I really don't have time for that. But they're like, well, we don't know what's happening. And it turns out that uh, the mayor was suing them for a very good reason. A councillor on a five-member council was, um, they were refusing to allow the clerk to go ahead with a harassment complaint. You know, the, the, the complaint came forward and the report said, okay, we're going to hire an outside firm to investigate this harassment complaint by the a, a sitting councillor of a staff member. And three of the five people of council just refused to, re to accept that report. And so they couldn't actually investigate this harassment. And the mayor decided, uh, you know, this is wrong. And the only way to do that is to sue my own council, except nobody in the town knew why this was happening. Hmm. And so I wrote one story. I mean, this is something that would have should have taken months and months of coverage. But this is what's happening across Ontario, uh, especially in smaller centers, where we just don't know what is happening on council. And we don't also have the reporters who have, uh, you know, some knowledge of how the rules are supposed to work. And so who knows what people are getting away with? David, I don't know if I'd make this argument, but uh, some people will make the argument that because you have, for example, a party whip in party politics at the provincial or federal level, there is at least somebody there whose job it is to make sure that people behave properly. And I guess it raises the question about whether or not bringing party politics to City Hall, which traditionally doesn't have party politics, might make a difference on this front. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure I would go that far, Steve. What I would uh, emphasize is the fact that you know the clerk of a municipality has a specific role in relation to enforcing what's called a procedural bylaw. So ultimately, the the um, uh, what happens at a council meeting uh, is um, is stated and how people are supposed to be able to um, uh, to act in that council meeting. Uh, the clerk is is primarily responsible for that, along with the head of council, who is ultimately again uh, the mayor. Reeve or whomever 
to to bring uh, decorum to that uh, to that particular proceeding. So I'm not entirely sure party politics is the uh, the solution to that. But ultimately, it is around again. We're talking about education of council, uh, of educating them in relation to what the most appropriate, um, uh, per, uh, you know, the proceed the procedural bylaw is, and how they really are supposed to be acting within that within that framework. Okay, John. One last question, and I'll put it to you. We all know we've heard this since we were kids, uh, taking civics in school, that uh, municipalities are creations of the province. They are creatures of the province. So the province ultimately uh, has a big say, and presumably has a role here. Do you know whether the province is doing much or anything to clean this up? Well, yes. Uh, uh, Creatures of the province, again, reiterated just uh, late last year by the Supreme Court of Canada, once again in the city of Toronto versus uh, the Attorney General of Ontario on the whole council uh, issue in the city of Toronto. Um, uh, Yeah, the province is looking at it. As I indicated before, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing had done a consultation. I had understood that changes were being proposed for late last year and we're still waiting and there's an election just around the corner. I don't think we're going to see them. You have a private member's bill that is now going to second reading uh, brought forward by a Ottawa City Councillor, a former Ottawa City Councillor who's now uh, a Liberal MP, uh, asking for greater powers, greater authority for the Integrity Commissioner to apply to the court to have someone removed, someone who's behaved egregiously badly uh, in accordance with the uh, Code of Conduct or other ethical uh, procedures or rules that the municipality has put in place. So I think the province is very mindful of this. Uh, will they have the guts to go forward with harsher uh, requirements for municipalities and their members, as Alberta did for uh, for their elected officials? Hmm. Less than two months before a provincial election, will they have enough guts? To ask the question answers it, I suspect. Uh, From left to right on my screen, David Arbuckle, John Mascara, and Joanne Chianello, really good of all of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.